get started. So thank you very much uh, for coming. I was actually, uh, I'm glad that we've at least got 10 people in the room. I was a little bit worried uh, yesterday when everyone was telling me that they're heading off early for flights and so forth. So I uh, appreciate you turning up uh, to this presentation. So we're going to talk about how a uh, consumer global data ecosystem can benefit everybody. And many of you have uh, heard of the name Veriglyph and many of you would associate us with the term blockchain. And uh, the good news is today that we're not going to focus on blockchain. We will talk about it uh, briefly and, and why it is an important element of, uh, of our solution. Um, but I think it's, look, it's fair to say there was a lot of noise last year. There was a lot of um, hype around blockchain and what it could uh, potentially do. And, and, uh, and it's fair to say that there are many projects that actually did not get off the ground. And so, uh, so today's not, not a focus specifically on blockchain. Uh, and blockchain probably represents about 10% of our overall solution. Um, there's many other parts to our, uh, to our platform. So that being said, I'm going to talk about three things that, um, that are important uh, to everybody in this room. Uh, and if they're not, come and tell me afterwards what, what is important to you. Um, and the three things are, uh, number one, that consumers will always expect and want to buy better products and services. And number two, brands are always trying to work out how they can deliver those better products and services. And number three, everyone in this room can be involved um, in achieving that. And so for the first two points, I want to uh, enlist uh, the following uh, quote. Now, this is from Mark. I don't know him personally, and he's not yet involved with Veriglyph, uh, but he has uh, someone who's very influential in the marketing uh, world. And if he's thinking this, then I, I can bet that most people in the marketing space are thinking the same. And he said that our vision is to build our brands through lifelong one-to-one -one relationships in real time with every person in the world. And for all of us, that's the problem that we're trying to solve. How do we... Um, develop those one-to-one -one relationships so that we can deliver the right message to the right person at the right time about the right things. And so the question is, how do we actually achieve this? So it requires an accurate personal data graph, as we call it, of, of individuals generated in real time across various verified data sources. Uh, so uh, Wayne Gretzky apparently once said that his success uh, was attributed to the fact that he always tried to skate to where the puck would be. And that's what we're trying to achieve with our uh, Veriglyph network of networks. And so big data was supposed to be the answer, um, but there's a lot of regulations around ownership and usage that are, have changed and are continuing to change. Um, and so that's been problematic. Uh, brands cannot simply consume all of the data that's available to them and, and um, without being assured that they have proper permission and, and rights to use that data. So today is not about selling Veriglyph, but it's probably important to tell you a little bit about um, our mission, uh, which is to connect the world's consumer art data ecosystems in real time. Um, we don't think that the way that we're going to create that is to um, disrupt the, the current ecosystem that exists. And we don't think that it's about creating another data silo of our own. Um, so we feel that um, the best way to achieve this is to work within the existing data stakeholders. Um, and so we'll create this digital connective <coughs> tissue that will connect up all these various sources in a way that benefits everyone and ultimately uh, allows brands to get access to more data to make better decisions to build better products. And so I want to tell you a little bit about um, our background, which will probably help you understand uh, our objectives. And so it was um, a number of us were involved in some uh, in the crypto space. Uh, some of us had a, a crypto mine and we're working on some software about how to how to optimize that. Uh, we're also working with um, a gentleman from the uh, Singapore Stock Exchange on a, uh, a crypto asset allocation algorithm, so choosing which uh, coin is the best one to actually invest in. And it was early last year that we're at, at CES, uh, and we saw a great idea of the use of blockchain that had two key ingredients. One is it uh, protected people's IP or ownership, and two, it allowed that to be further monetized. Two key ingredients. There always needs to be a business case around um, anything we do as businesses, obviously. And so um, Kodak uh, presented an idea uh, that they are working on uh, called the Kodak coin. And essentially it allowed um, photographers or artists to um, prove that they owned a particular photo. Um, so for those um, you know, who may be aware of, uh, this is a particular problem with photographers who, you know, they take a picture of them, put it on their Facebook page and someone steals it and uses it for, for some other purpose. And how do they actually prove that that was their photo? Right? How do they go back and, and, and find out? So what they propose is a solution to allow those artists, as soon as they've taken a photo, some time shortly afterwards, to actually put that photo into the blockchain to prove that they are the ones who own it. At this point in time, they are the author of that photo. Uh, and then secondly, the most, perhaps the most important part, or the reason for them to actually want to do that is it, is it allowed them to monetize that. So what the um, Kodak built is a, 
a tool that would go throughout the web and look for any time anyone's used that photo and check whether they have a license to use it. And if they don't, then um, initiate an automatic uh, process to actually um, uh, create a license with them. So it had those two accreting grids, protecting IP ownership, recording something that's happened, and actually allow it to be monetized. And so when we started thinking, you know, we've been in, uh, involved in the market research industry, thinking about how to adopt those two, same two key principles around how do we prove uh, that we have right to use the data, how do we also further monetize the data that, that's available within the industry. Uh, and so that's when the idea. Now, we, we were uh, once known as MR Chain, um, and it was... And it was during one of the conversations that we were going very wide in our consultative phase, uh, talking to many industry bodies, many industry experts, uh, and really trying to make sure that we don't make some of the mistakes that we've made in the past around building products that uh, we thought everybody wanted and then um, didn't actually end up using. So there's a, a quick example. We, we built a product uh, about 10 years ago that was largely like a, a Centaur or a Lucid today. Uh, it was a a sample marketplace, and uh, it was about, done about 10 years ago. We, we, had, we ran that for about six months, and then it died. We actually didn't understand. Um, there was something that wasn't quite right with that product that we didn't do enough research on, and, um, and we shut that one down. So we wanted to make sure we didn't make the same mistakes again. And so we were very consultative. And it was during one of these discussions that we um, were talking to Lenny and his team from Green Book, and they were working on a, a similar concept um, around uh, around these same, same two principles, further monetization, getting access to more data, but also making sure it's verified and, and we have access to it. And so in that true spirit of, uh, of being a network of networks, it made sense that we would um, uh, merge with, their, with them, and, and so we were now, now known as Veriglyph. And so the word Veriglyph actually comes from two words. It's, it's a, uh, a weird match of two, two words. First one, Veritas, means truth, and the other one is Petroglyph, which is a, uh, an image carved on a rock that lasts thousands of years. And so the word uh, veriglyph means a true picture. And uh, for those who have, been, who have ever actually had to create a, a business name or a domain name, it is a, a tough task. And we actually uh, weren't really sold on the name. We thought, OK, the consumers are never going to see it. We're not actually going to deal with them. We'll deal with it for now, and we'll, and we'll change it at a later stage. But it's kind of growing on us at, at the moment. Uh, so we're a team of, uh, of, of 10 strong, um, some of the faces you would recognize down the bottom there. Um, and we're about to put on, uh, make an announcement next week about another uh, individual who's going to join the team. Um, so someone who's quite experienced who will help us. Um, I think it's useful to uh, probably explain what we're not before we explain what we are. What, what, is, um, what we don't think will actually drive um, participation and actually achieve our goal. So we're not actually uh, a panel. We have no objective in being a panel. And it's actually against our our mantra of actually bringing in all of these data sources together. If we were creating, trying to create our own panel, then we'd actually be competing with the various companies that we're actually trying to bring on board. So we're not actually trying to create a panel. We also don't have and won't have any direct connection with the consumers, and that's why we weren't too fussed about the name Veriglyph. Uh, we thought, no one will ever see it, the consumers won't see it. So we're not actually trying to take over that relationship in any way, shape, or form. The existing ecosystem structure of a, an agent that represents the consumer uh, is the model that we think is, um, uh, has legs. Consumers, you know, they, they, want to, uh, they don't actually understand the network of how to actually buy and sell, and so we think that um, you know, an agent act on their behalf is the best way forward. Um, we are not trying to implement a crypto coin or an incentive system. Uh, we uh, dabbled with this idea uh, last year around sort of a common reward wallet. Um, and then we've you know, since learned that it's actually quite a complex uh, system to navigate the various incentives that are used across the industry. So it's, it's far too difficult to, to try and um, bring all those various incentives into one system. And, so, and we don't think it'll actually drive um, the participation up as well. So, so we're, not a, uh, we're not an incentive system. We are not trying to merge all records into one panel, so into, or into one record, sorry. Um, so um, the, the data that exists will stay where it currently does. What we are is uh, essentially think of as like a catalog of the data that's available, and we're not trying to blend it all into one. So all of the data sources will continue to hold their intellectual property where they do, uh, and it won't be, won't be blended. Um, and we're not allowing everybody to see everything. So um, there are various versions of blockchain, and we'll talk a little bit about the version of blockchain that we're using, which is called private blockchain, which, it, which is quite different to public blockchain. So we won't allow everybody to see everything. Um, so it's quite important for businesses. You, know, you have strategic uh, partners that you work with. You, have, um, you don't necessarily want to share everything with everybody. And so we use a version of blockchain called private blockchain that prevents that. Um, and we're not uh, exclusive. Our objective is to connect with as many 
uh, data sources as possible within the industry, so traditional panels, uh, crypto panels, ad networks, and so forth. Our objective is to um, get, get access to all of the available data. Um, so what are the key ingredients for a, an ecosystem like this, um, a, or a network of networks, as we call it? So um, first of all, it needs to be privacy compliant, it needs to be permission-based, and it needs to be trusted. And there also needs to be, make sure there's actually a clear benefit for everybody. So um, the reality is brands need more data to make better decisions. And the current ecosystem of data sitting in silos um, has probably reached its limit. A lot of the research that we do is largely, largely independent of all the other available data sources. And so what we're building is a, what we call a network of networks. The ability to reach out and connect to as much data as possible in a privacy compliant way. Um, Brand compliance managers need to make sure that the data that they are consuming is privacy compliant and, and, and permission uh, has been given to use it. The last thing that a, a company wants to do is ingest and use a whole pile of data that they find out later on they actually cannot use and, and they shouldn't have used it. And there's plenty of examples in the news of, of cases like that. So they need to be assured and guaranteed that the data that they're using um, it can be used. It also needs to be trusted, so a key ingredient of our network um, is the fact that the data is actually verified as put into the network, um, something that is quite unique. And the other key ingredient is, is there needs to be a business case. It needs to be actually make sure that uh, the burden of, uh, of adopting and implementing a system like this does not rely with one particular person and that there is a clear benefit for everybody involved. So to summarize that, there's, there's the three, uh, three key features. First of all, as, as explained, uh, verification of data. So we work with verification partners like I360 and Imperium and others. We also allow the data uh, that's in our network to be optionally matched against other partners in the network. So if we've got three different data sources, we're allowing the data to be um, compared against uh, uh, other data sources as well. And so we use a combination of AI to normalize the data to actually understand what the various fields are, and then we um, hash up the data and we um, compare it in a way that doesn't that actually two parties actually don't see the data. We never see the data as well. Um, so it's always, we never actually see the raw data. We only deal with uh, an encrypted or a hashed version of the data. Um, and so we match, we match it up and, in, and can then tell you from a particular consumer um, how many of those fields um, are validated, how many are like another field that's either with one of our verification partners or somebody else in the network. We won't tell you where it matched in somebody else in the network, um, but we'll tell you it matched on three different other sources, uh, as an example. Um, additionally, um, the data graph um, needs to, um, this data graph as we call it, it which is basically a, um, a network of all of the available data sources, is put into a way that you can actually identify an individual, um, uh, or it can be anonymous, so two, two scenarios, and search in the network and actually purchase that data that's available and be assured that you can use it and it's, and, um, and it's made available for you to purchase. So, um, and then finally, the, um, the network needs a, an auditable privacy consent and transaction history. So what we mean by that is, uh, and this is one of the main reasons that we're actually using that, that blockchain component within our network, is to show um, a provenance of the data to show uh, where privacy was given. Imagine if you're blending data from lots of different sources, that's a complex task. Where privacy was given. And also, additionally, if you do purchase that to show uh, a transaction history, and that's particularly important with some of the regulations around uh, GDPR, you know, the, uh, an individual needs to actually know who has touched their data so that they can go and, if they want to, request that to be taken out. And so it's quite important that we show, uh, we store that in a way that's immutable, that cannot be deleted uh, or cannot be modified. And if it is modified, you can, you can detect it and show in a way that um, allows them to actually request through their agent um, who has ever, ever touched their data. Um, now, I did, we, we did talk briefly about the fact that we are using a different flavor of blockchain. And so we call this, it is private blockchain or private enterprise blockchain. And it has probably three key ingredients that are different to uh, a public blockchain system. So the first one is controlled transparency. Um, so um, we are using, think of, um, think of public blockchain as Ethereum and Bitcoin and things like that. We're using a flavor of a blockchain called Hyperledger. And it has this concept of controlled uh, transparency. It doesn't make sense for most businesses in the world to share everything with everybody. Um, and so in, in this particular network, you can um, choose um, how much you share and who you share it with. Uh, a quick example is you can provide a link uh, to your customer to show 
that allows them to actually go back into the, uh, to our network and see all the verification that was done on all the participants that took part in, in, your, uh, in your study or, or the data that you've actually bought. So you can choose you know, what level of information. It also has controlled transactions. So most businesses um, may choose not to buy and sell from a competitor. Uh, and that's the, tr the traditional way that we do businesses. And so transactions can be controlled. You can choose who you do business with. You can either choose it by category. You can say, I don't want to ever sell data to any other panel company, for argument's sake. Or I want to sell it, only sell it to these three companies that I've got an MDA with. And so it allows you to mimic the more traditional way that we do business. And uh, the last most important part, and this is particular case for, for the Hyperledger uh, system that we're using, is that everybody is uh, identified. There is no anonymous users in the network. Everybody goes through what we call a, a, a root uh, certificate authority that allows us to actually know who they are, which, which plays to the second part is if you want to control the transactions and choose who you're doing business with, you actually need to know who they are. And that's the, that's the traditional way we do business. We choose who we do business with. We choose to strategically not to share everything with everybody, um, and we need to know who we're doing business with. And so that's what uh, private blockchain allows. So this network uh, that we're building, we, we are uh, forming a partnership with IBM. We're working to, towards that at the moment. And the reason why we chose um, IBM is they are experts in the private enterprise blockchain space. They're, they're one of the founding partners um, of the Hyperledger network, uh, Hyperledger Foundation, and um, are really seen and have actually done quite a number of projects in this space already. And I'll share a video briefly on some of those. So um, there is a project with, with Maersk uh, called Trade Lens. They've got a project in, in Canada which allows banks to share uh, KYC information. They've also got a project, uh, the Food Trust, if those of you may have heard of Walmart's Food Trust Network as well. So they've actually got a, quite a bit of experience in building these very large scale um, uh, networks that actually have a clear business case. And so that's why we're, we're partnering with IBM uh, to do that. Probably more importantly, the reason that, uh, that we're excited about it is that um, IBM have a partnership with MediaOcean. So MediaOcean are a platform that, um, that allow buying and selling of online advertising and they transact around $150 billion a year uh, through their platform. And they're actually disrupting themselves. They've actually identified that around 60% of that $150 billion um, cannot be accounted for in the sense that they, they're not actually sure that actually would, the ad was delivered to the right audience. And so they're disrupting themselves. They've actually got a pilot running right now with a number of brands, including Kellogg and Pfizer and Unilever uh, and others, to um, the first stage in that pilot is actually to automate that bind and selling, to so, uh, take away some of the inefficiencies of, of um, that bind and selling process. But they're also working with another partner um, called Lucidity, not, not Lucid, but Lucidity, who, uh, whose objective is they've got some tools to actually check that the ads have been delivered to the right uh, intended audience. And so they're trying to um, eliminate some of that waste. Now where Veriglyph comes into it is that we um, will be able to power the actual decision making process of, of those ads. So bring back to that same message, delivering the right, the right message to the right person with a verified data source. So the data that's in a network will be verified and allow, allow them to actually um, deliver the right ad to the intended audience. Um, and we're on our way. We, uh, we don't do, th do things small. It's a big undertaking, obviously, that we're involved in. Um, we started the consultative process uh, middle of last year and went really wide. Uh, we, we spoke to many, uh, many people in that process. Um, we've conducted our first um, design thinking workshop, uh, which was held in New York. And we had a number of industry experts that came uh, in October into what IBM called the garage. Uh, and uh, it's a very trendy uh, workplace up in New York. And, uh, we, uh, we really set about the objective of trying to understand, all right, if we're actually going to build this and it actually has uh, a business case, well, first of all, we have to verify that, that, that it does have a business case. What is the first thing that we're going to tackle? So in that agile methodology of, you know, you can't boil the ocean, you need to do things in bite-sized chunks, um, we set about and, and, and identified that the two most important things are identity and validation. Uh, there's lots of other features that the network needs to have, but they're the two most important things that we targeted. And so we set about building a pre-pilot. And so um, our CTO built some, built some software, gave it to two um, participants. Um, one was a panel company and one was a validation partner. And set about to actually prove that um, we could normalize the data, we could understand various different fields, we could use some AI to actually um, uh, under, understand those fields and normalize them. Um, so think about the complexity of addresses and date formats and all the various uh, complexities around data. Uh, it's a little bit of a task to actually get that into a common format and then hash it up, compare it without either party ever seeing each other's data and verify that 
We could actually do identity without strong identifiers, so we're not using, uh, in, that, in that particular example, there was no email addresses, there was no telephone numbers, there was no um, social security numbers or anything like that. So we're able to identify an individual at a household level, an individual level, without actually uh, having strong identifiers. Um, but also to see um, the various fields that we have, we could actually um, validate them and show what percentage um, of the records were a match. Um, we held our second uh, design thinking workshop a couple of weeks ago um, back at the garage in IBM. We had about 36 people attend and um, the uh, purpose of that was to really further define um, what we were thinking, whether the validation was something that was worth tackling and sort of expand that and for the purpose of IBM creating a scope so they can go and build it. Uh, and it was actually interesting that in that session we realised that um, that what we thought was, um, was important and enough business case for people to actually get involved wasn't. We, needed to, we were focused on this validation as uh, something that was very critical, um, but it needed to ex be expanded. It needed to be expanded in such a way that it included access to the data. Uh, and so it was very important learnings that we, we gained in that, uh, in that process. Of it. And so um, where we're at now is we are in the process of uh, putting together a pilot um, while IBM are about to start, so they'll start building in another month's time, and it'll take them about eight weeks to actually build this first version. And, and while that's running, we're actually also running a pilot, so we've identified some participants to actually um, run through a real-world scenario of enriching data from various data sources, validating the data uh, and enriching it, and um, running through a scenario where a, a gen pop study is enriched with further information to actually understand uh, the individuals. So I'll show you, uh, here's a photo of some of those who attended. Uh, as you probably see some familiar faces. Um, I'll show you. <laughs> Where are you, Anna? Oh, there we go. <laughs> yes. Um, and so I'll show you this just to really show sort of the importance that individuals placed on this. And so, I mean, when, when it was late December that I was talking to Lenny and I was saying, look, we're probably leaving a little bit too late to try and get everybody to come in such short notice. Uh, and we're actually very overwhelmed with the actual uh, response that we got. So we had 36 individuals travel from six countries, over 31,000 miles uh, just to get there. And probably what's most scary is there was about 700 years of uh, experience in the room. And so um, it was, uh, there was a lot of enthusiasm and, and sort of interest to actually say, um, you know, we think, this is, we think there's something interesting here. We actually wanted to understand it more. And so we went through that process. Um, I'm going to show you now a video from uh, Chad. So Chad works within IBM uh, in the blockchain advertising space. Uh, and he actually lives in Austin, and so when we were flying in, he was flying out to uh, the Think, the Think uh, conference that's running right now. And so um, there's a short interview that I'm going to share with him, so he didn't completely get out of uh, presenting with me. My, my role is, is now to, to own the strategy, business development, and most importantly, the execution of blockchain for advertising at IBM. Um, I, I would start by saying why blockchain. So very, you know, kind of high level, there are economic eras that get defined by the ability to take constraints out of markets and supply chains. Um, you think of in industrialization as being one. You think of going from brick and mortar to the communications revolution of the internet as being another. And those essentially change the entire cost structure of the business models um, in, in entire business networks. And, and we're, we're at another one of those big inflection points around blockchain where Essentially, by baking identity and trust as a layer into these business networks, you can really dramatically reduce the unit costs of transactions. IBM, IBM we have invested heavily. We were one of the founding members of Hyperledger, the, the Linux Foundation, the fastest growing uh, project in history. is a bit of context first. So 90% of the world's goods are in some way uh, touched by overseas shipment, um, whether it's components or the entire good themselves. So, um, but within that supply chain, let's take a perishable, like a container shipment of flowers. If I want to send that from Madagascar to, um, you know, to Rotterdam, um, there's 
30 organizations and up to 200 pieces of paperwork that accompany that. So you have all these different ports and government entities and suppliers that are all have a piece of that supply chain uh, that are heavily dependent on each other. And where any breakdown in any of those approvals or any of that process can delay the shipment of that perishable item and that ultimately uh, you know, can, can ruin the inventory, cause delays, there's you know, a, a, a large susceptibility for fraud to be, uh, to be uh, injected in the supply chain. So the, the solution was pretty simple, which is let's just digitize this entire supply chain on a shared distributed ledger system uh, where you know, the, the key constituents across that supply chain can have access into you know, where, where each shipment, where each container is in its life cycle. And then you know, the intent is by building applications over that network, you can start to get some of those inefficiencies out of the system. Um, seems like a very simple idea and concept. The um, World Trade Organization looked at that use case and said, you know, if you get all those inefficiencies out for every container shipment globally, that could increase global trade by 15% and have a positive 5% overall impact on world GDP. Uh, that's like $3 trillion use case. So if that's implemented at scale across the entire industry, every competitor, Maersk is one uh, shipping leader, there are their competitors as well, you know, if it's, if it's implemented at scale, $3 trillion in value, which also speaks to the profound impact. It's not, even though it's a relatively simple cha uh, change by getting some of this inefficiency, uh, you know, out of, out of data immediacy and quality uh, and trust within these networks, the, the, the ripple effect is very large. This is a perfect analogy for MERSC. The rising tide lifts all ships. Um, in that type of a, a broad application of a, of a, a network that, that you know, crosses an entire industry, there's a problem that the different competitors would have with any one entity having uh, a majority of control or ownership in that. Because there is skepticism that a lot of the you know, would-be sort of innovators around federating data access or controlling the transmission and inventorying of data, that their real agenda is for them to not disrupt the data oligarchs um, to the benefit of where the value should be exchanged, but to actually become new intermediaries with some type of special backdoor access to the data. Again, I, I believe that, that the intent of Veriglyph is pure in terms of trying to, to decentralize this not for Veriglyph's benefit as a new centralized entity, but for the decentralized benefit of, of those who collect the data and want to use it for their enterprise business purposes and those who contribute the data um, that want to receive some type of value back in exchange. So when you look at the, the data, panel data, for example, um, any enterprise, so if I'm the chief digital officer of name any brand, I don't want to name anybody or call anybody out, but any major enterprise, there are uh, increasing um, difficulties and liabilities that they have in ensuring the compliant, the compliant organization and use of data. So, of course, GDPR in California are just examples. There's going to be an ever-changing regulatory environment. Um, the onus on, on the enterprise to have to manage all of that um, for every data set, how it's collected, um, you know, if there's a status change. Those, those are very difficult things to, to manage. So th there's a real need at the enterprise level um, for the compliance portion, but it also feeds into some horizontals that need to exist for data to be exchanged across different marketplaces so that, first of all, it's transparent and there's ethical, fair sourcing and use of that data, um, but also that the data can, the, the use of it can be maximized through understanding, um, you know, so the, the horizontals, you know, first of all, unif universal identifier. If there's data in one CRM that relates to the same consumer in either owned or earned or paid media somewhere else, can we link all of that data through universal identifier? So you can have some type of uh, you know, identity resolution and identity graph that's you know, kind of standardized. Um, 
there needs to be a standard way of encrypting that data and transmitting that data, um, you know, so that it's, it's truly secure and there can't be data leakage. Uh, there needs to be ways of resolving the, or actually propagating changes in that data. So if I change my address and there's essentially a new version of my data, can that get propagated everywhere where my data is being housed? Um, you know, and, and can you have sort of a universal, universality around the, uh, the, the you know, the, the data itself and its quality and who it relates to. Um, and then as importantly, if you can do that, which has obvious benefits, and for, especially if you're proving that it's compliant, um, the next step is, is how do you then leverage that data? So what I like a lot about Veriglass is the fact that there are these horizontal needs for things like universal identity and workflow to resolve identity. And, a secure encrypted methodology for transferring this data from one environment to another. Uh, so I, I think the idea of a Veriglyph network is at its, at its core is integrity. Um, so you know, we're talking pedantically about, about survey data, but there's a, an implied value exchange in there. And then there's a greater value by being able to attach the, da the data that's being collected to the identity and other sources of data related to individuals to be able to resolve their identity, be able to match it to where it lives across the different enterprises across that supply chain, whether it's the CRM of you know, a, a brand or whether it's in the, you know, a DMP somewhere, being able to have all of that data resolved to an identity and have more ethical use of that data for targeting, it gets more of the bot traffic out of the equation. It gets more of the unknowns and having to create lookalike models and, and, um, and uh, you know, it, it becomes more deterministic, essentially. So I, I think Veriglyph is, is completely on the right track in terms of creating a shared business network that has on one end the integrity of the consumer and the value shared by the consumer, um, but also the ability to, to federate in a way that's compliant and fair and transparent, um, you know, for for essentially what really matters, which is to improve the the outcomes of you know, create better products, um, create you know better um, you know better business models. Uh, so again, I think I think Veriglyph, it's it truly is there. It's it's a pretty altruistic thing that they're doing, um, you know, by just essentially on one end making the data more effective. Um, and, and, and the other side, making it a bit more transparent and compliant. Okay. Did everyone see the dog come in at the end there? <laughs> <laughs> yes. So we had a, a visitor. So, um, I mean, he shared one example of, uh, of Maersk, um, but, and there's a lot of similarities. It, it's a, you know, a goods uh, supply network. What we're talking about is a data supply network. So there are some similarities, uh, which is why uh, we wanted to share that particular example. Um, now, with this, this presentation is talking about uh, the benefits of everybody with a network like this. And so um, let's talk about what some of those benefits are. Uh, and so the respondents. So we, t we just heard uh, a great presentation from Andrew, and I encourage those of you who haven't read the book to read it, um, uh, his book. Um, and we've learned that, you know, time and time again, there's research on research which says, you know, the common things that people complain about. You know, we heard about um, uh, the length of surveys being too long. We heard about people asking me the same question. You know, if I went up to an individual and they said, John, what's your name? And the next day I ask you the same question, what's your name? You know, it, it's frustrating. It's not respectful to the individual, right? So there's a lot of uh, issues around that. Um, we also hear that the incentives are not enough, right? So for the compensation. And so if we truly want brands to be able to build these better products and services, how do we um, have a benefit for the respondents to drive participation up? And so um, what if we could actually trust the data that we've got on them in such a way that we don't need to ask them those same questions again? What if we could trust the demographic information that has been validated so we don't need to keep asking them the same questions again? Um, so then surely that's going to reduce the actual survey duration time and it's going to reduce their fatigue in doing the surveys. Um, and what if the respondent could actually earn an incentive every time that their data is bought within the network? Um, so they're not necessarily having to do a survey. They might have done a survey a while back and we've got some extra um, behavioural data as well as opinion data on them and profile data. What if um, that data could be sold multiple times and every time it is sold uh, that the individual um, is paid an incentive by their panel company? Um, and so um, we think that these will drive participation rates up. And additionally, because of obviously regulations that are in force, they need the ability to have transparency over who's actually accessed their data. So through our network, through their actual agent, they'll have greater transparency um, on how their data has been used. 
And particularly important for, the, for this particular audience is the, the benefit to the suppliers. Um, so as our network expands into other industries, and we shared one example of um, how um, through the partnership of Media Ocean, there's another use case of how this data can be used. More and more, as we get that network effect of more data sources, then obviously there is more use cases of how this data can be used. And so it's really greater monetization of their data assets, being able to sell it as often as they possibly can. Um, we don't want this network to be a, a race to the bottom in terms of price. We actually want it to be a high quality validated uh, network and so not to actually cause that uh, the prices to decrease. Um, to actually allow individuals to stand out and say our data is good quality and we've, we've ver verified it and we can prove it. Um, so, and, and additionally data owners or data agents will be able to prove where permission has been given. Um, it's particularly important to make sure that they actually can use it. The ultimate beneficiaries of this network uh, are the brands, and some of the benefits include faster access to more verified data, being able to dip into the network and pull that data out and make sure that everybody that was involved in the collection of that data is fairly uh, compensated for doing so. <coughs> They're able to know that they are using the data, so this, this sort of compliance tool benefit is being able to know they can use it. They'll be able to do more longitudinal research, which is where we believe that uh, most of the research needs to go on, rather than just point in time, throw the research away, um, the ability to track an individual and retarget them at another point in time, find out what other information you know about them in six months' time. Um, so that longitudinal, and has their behaviour or has their opinion changed on a particular topic? Um, brands can also enhance their CRM. Uh, so if you've got a brand new customer and you want to know more about them, um, rather than actually just um, sending them a survey or asking more questions, you can dip into the network and uh, purchase that data in a way that's not creepy to them, right? They've already given consent to actually use that data, and so you can... Um, uh, find out more about them. Um, and another use case is brands can actually maintain their CRM. So um, Chad shared that example of, you know, if, a, um, if data that was on one particular source has been updated, someone's changed their address or changed some details about themselves, being able to alert all the people who also have the same data to sell it. That way, you will tell them that, you know, the data has changed and they can optionally choose to go and purchase that data from that source as well uh, at that point in time. So really keeping their data up to date. So loop, looping back to uh, what we spoke about at the start, which is that consumers will always want to buy better products and services. Brands will always want to discover how they can do that uh, and that everyone in the room can be a part of this ecosystem. Um, it's really what we want to drive home today. Um, uh, I'd like, yeah, so we've got some time now for questions. I think we do. Or, uh, we're going for time. It says zero on the, on the thing at the bottom here, so <laughs> maybe we don't. Is there any questions? Is, is one of the challenges we've explained anything technical and... John, you'll, you'll feel for me here is that it's hard to explain things that are technical sometimes, and so uh, too much information and too little information. So if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them now. Um, you can reach me on LinkedIn or my email address um, if you'd like to uh, contact me directly. Can I ask, what yep. is the type of, what, what are the constraints on the data? Like what, yep. what is the type, what is, what's the range of the type of data that can be part of this? And I yep. guess what's the sweet spot, like is the sweet yeah. spot demographic data? Um, look, it will be anything from profile data to behavioural data, um, there, you know, and it's probably in order of what's easiest to use. Profile data is the easiest to use, uh, behavioural data, and then opinion data. Um, so we have to use um, AI to really actually understand the data. I mean, as, as um, you, I think you touched on yesterday, was that data is in lots of different formats, right? It's never, never consistent. So how do you actually convert a, uh, actually, it might not have been you, somebody else talked about the, you know, one question which asks, you know, everything from what is your income? Right? There are lots and lots of different ways of doing that, and so using tools to actually try and normalise that in a, in a way that's actually usable. Yeah. So, okay, so instead yeah. of having some predefined taxonomy or standard, Correct. you guys are trying to we're, we're, massage We're going the other way. We're trying to make it uh, in such a way that... Um, so there will be... Um, we have explored the concept of some, some taxonomy for some of the uh, yeah. profile information. Um, our objective is to go as far as we can with AI to, uh, to do that automatically. Yeah, and so we... Uh, as part of that pre-pilot, we did a little bit of that. Right. Yeah. Uh, so we um, you know, mapped some fields, two different providers, two different field names, and then two different ways of actually storing the data. So a, an address was an example in that one. Yeah. Address was all over the place. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So. Is there any other questions? No? Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much for attending.